Welcome to the Creative Pen Podcast. I'm Joanna Penn, thriller author and creative entrepreneur, bringing you interviews, inspiration and information on writing, publishing options and marketing ideas for your book. You can find the episode show notes, your free author blueprint and lots more information at thecreativepen.com and that's pen with a double N. And here's the show. Hello creatives, I'm Joanna Penn and this is episode number 593 of the podcast and it is Friday the 17th of December 2021 as I record this from Auckland in New Zealand in a closet (laughs) and it has been the tail end of a hurricane this week so it's been wild and windy. So in today's show, I'm doing a solo episode that will help you plan your writing for 2022. And I'll be sharing a couple of chapters from my Productivity for Authors book in the main section of the podcast on how to find the time to write and how to make the most of your writing time. So I know I talk a lot about technology and the future as well as publishing and marketing and business things on this show. But in the end, we are authors first and it always comes down to the writing, to the craft. And for most of us, planning often for the year comes down to making more time to write. So I hope it helps you to revisit the basics as (laughs) I needed it myself as well. So that's coming up. And of course, if you would like the rest of the audiobook for Productivity for Authors, or indeed any of my ebooks, audiobooks, and courses, then I have a coupon 2021 uh, left for the rest of the year. So you can get 30% off any of my ebooks, audiobooks, and courses if you use the coupon 2021 at checkout, either on payhip.com forward slash the creative pen or the creative pen.com forward slash learn coupon 2021-2021, valid, as you've guessed it, to the end of 2021. So uh, yeah, check that out and I'll be playing an excerpt in the main part of the podcast coming up. So in publishing and book marketing news, Christine Catherine Rush has an article that she's called The Big Split about how the new world of publishing has now been around for over a decade and longer than that if you've been doing it as long as we have. Now, Chris says, I've been waiting to see when the two versions of publishing, traditional and indie, would actually split into two drastically different industries. It's happened slower than I thought it would. And she gives a number of reasons why, including the fact that many indie writers often cross back over seeking validation. And of course, because the industries look similar in terms of the product. So a book in various formats doesn't look that much different in its final product, even though the business practices and some of the other things behind it are quite different. So Chris says the two industries shadow each other, but they are not the same and they haven't been the same for years now. Finally, though, that lack of similarity has showed up in the numbers. She says the press that covers traditional publishing has declared ebook growth over, (laughs) which yeah makes me laugh. But of course, that doesn't include hardly any indie sales and it certainly doesn't include borrows or subscriptions or direct sales or other means of sale like Kickstarters or other crowdfunding. Or there are so many ways in which we shift copies of books that are not through the traditional channels. And I actually saw this reflected this attitude like, oh, these things are over. I saw this reflected in one of the Facebook groups that I'm in, where one traditionally published author said that her agent had told her that paranormal romance just doesn't sell anymore. There was no point in writing it as readers don't buy it anymore. And I had to jump in and say that that cannot be correct, that that must just be traditional publishing doesn't publish it anymore because they basically left that category to indies and primarily ebooks. So paranormal romance, of course, is a huge market, but it's dominated by indies and many of whom are doing incredibly well. But it was very interesting to hear that this writer wanted to write paranormal romance, but the agent was saying, essentially that she couldn't sell it to traditional publishing. It's not that the readers, if you, the perspective of the readers want more paranormal romance, but the traditional markets have changed. So Chris goes into a lot of detail about the numbers and why they're so flawed. And she concludes, here's the 2021 takeaway. 
the numbers are finally starting to show the massive disparity between indie book sales and traditional book sales. Traditionally published, uh, traditional publishers are seeing a decline in ebook revenue. Indies are not. We look like part of the same industry, but we're really not. And the split between the two is showing. It's an interesting article. Of course, there's a lot more in it. You can check it out at chriswrites.com and I'll put the link in the show notes. But it, uh, I, again, coming back to the futurist stuff, I feel more and more and more that we have more in common with a lot of, I guess, what's now the creator economy and uh, some of the more, I guess, digitally minded creators in music and art and all of that kind of thing, rather than uh, traditionally published authors and the traditional publishing industry. I feel like there's, in terms of the way you could stratify business, we have more in common with other industries that have already gone sort of fully digital. So yeah, very interesting article. I also wanted to talk about something cool that happened actually just in the last day or so that demonstrates the value of thinking long term about your intellectual property and not being hung up on launch and, you know, ads and sales immediately. So it's a bit of a, it's quite convoluted, but this proves a point. So you probably know that the Tim Ferriss podcast, which I'm sure many of you listen to, is a market maker for books. Anything Tim talks about usually sells. <laughs> and this week he had an excerpt from the audiobook of 4,000 Weeks, Time Management for Mortals by Oliver Berkman, which, uh, you know, the excerpt was very good. And of course, lots of people, including myself, bought the book immediately in one of its many formats. It's on my my phone and I'm listening to the audiobook. Now, what was cool is that the chapter that was excerpted mentioned another book, well, more of an essay that I recognised called The Universe Doesn't Give a Flying F About You by John Johnny Truant, who many of you will know from the Sterling and Stone imprint, from the self-publishing podcast from years gone by, and if you've been around as long as me, the early days of Copyblogger when Johnny used to guest post and run his own courses for online entrepreneurs. In fact, I was one, I bought Johnny's courses when he was back in those days before he ever wrote fiction. And now if you go check out Johnny Truant and Sterling and Stone, you'll see how many books Johnny has now written. Now he wrote that essay. I remember when he wrote it, it was like a decade ago on his blog. And then he published it as a little Kindle essay. Uh, it's actually under just, I think, Jay Truant. And no doubt uh, that will now lead to sales. It's mentioned in the book, which is now going on to sell a ton of copies. And the book, uh, 4,000 Weeks, was published August 2021. So it's probably been over a decade that that essay's been around. It's been, I think, seven, eight years since that Kindle book's been around. And it will bring people into the ecosystem. It's also interesting. So it's fascinating to me to think how this happened. And also, Tim was recommended 4,000 weeks by a friend. He read it. He loved it. He reached out to the publisher to exit a chapter. Of course, they said yes, sensibly. <laughs> In terms of marketing, sharing that content is a really good idea. And that's also what made me think that this show, I would share some excerpts from my own audiobooks, because when you hear an audiobook uh, chapter and you decide whether or not you like the narrator, that can lead, and of course, the content that can lead into more sales. So this is interesting from a publishing and book marketing sense, because something Johnny wrote that long ago made it somehow into Oliver Berkman's research for a book that has now hit a zeitgeist and word of mouth brought it to Tim Ferriss. It went out as an audio excerpt, which means it was discovered in quite a different way. Uh, and now I'm telling you about the episode. So this is a long term approach to intellectual property. The fact that you might write something that takes a decade to reach someone else, it might sell millions, it might sell nothing, it might bring people into your ecosystem in a really random way. <laughs> but focusing on creating intellectual property and putting it into the world. And of course, we all do marketing, but it's not doesn't have to be immediate. It's like this is our career. This is our life. This is the long term approach. And trust that over time, your work will find an audience somehow. And this kind of marketing, I find, is important for our sanity as we move into a period where, let's face it, we all need a break. We we want to probably take more time off the internet rather than spending more time on it. So I hope that that will encourage you. I know it's... <laughs> and also... 
you can't aim for something like that to happen. You can't. I mean, the fact that nobody pitched Tim Ferriss with this book, he you know, he found it himself. A friend told him. No one, you know, I don't think Johnny Truant pitched Oliver Berkman to include his book in 4,000 Weeks. It's it's just this ecosystem idea, this discovery system that works over time. So I don't know, it just made me happy to think about this and sort of a long-term approach to things. In fact, a journalist, um, I had an hour on the phone with a journalist today uh, who had found me because they'd done a Google search and I came up and they reached out. So these things happen. It's not all about the now. It's not all about the ads. So yeah, hope that encourages you. So in futurist stuff, those of you who've been following me for a while know that I learned about online business, blogging and podcasting from Yarrow Starak back, back in uh, 2008, who has been on the podcast several times over the years. I've introduced him to you on this show. And he is one of the voices I trust in terms of what is worth paying attention to. And I know that he's built up significant businesses uh, over the last, um, what, 20 years on the internet, both in sort of web one, web two, and now web three. He's a writer and an educator who takes complicated topics and makes them more easily digestible. (laughs) So I am really pleased that Yarrow has done a roundup article about the various aspects of Web3. It's called What is Web3 and How You Can Capitalise on the Dawn of Decentralisation. And it covers blockchain, NFTs, play to earn, metaverse, decentralised social media, crowdfunding, with creator coins, crypto and DeFi, DAOs and more. And if you don't know what those terms are, (laughs) then don't worry. What is interesting is that Yarrow really talks about how these things work together for what Web3 might turn into. But remember, the headline says the dawn of decentralization. So as ever, all the things are, it's early days, basically. But If you've been interested in anything I've been talking about this year in terms of these futurist topics, check out the article as it puts a lot of it together in a more coherent way. So I've given you kind of a bit over here and a bit over there and a bit here and Yarrow's put it all together. So I have um, links in the show notes, but I have a short link, thecreativepen.com forward slash Yarrow Web 3, Y-A-R-O Web number three. A link in the show notes. Now, in terms of my personal update, (laughs) I just published a dark Christmas short story called A Midwinter Sacrifice. And uh, I actually wrote this about five years ago, um, the first draft, and then I put it away and I just felt nobody wants to read a dark Christmas story. Everyone likes a happy ending at Christmas. And then this year, it just seems really right. (laughs) And I actually added an author's note about why I feel this is a good time to release a dark story. So it's called A Midwinter Sacrifice. And interestingly, from a publishing perspective, I have put it in KU. (gasps) Shock horror, even though I'm wide with everything else under JF Penn. So basically, this is an individual short story. It's what about three and a half thousand words. And my short story sales of individual short stories are non-existent on the other platforms, uh, mainly because promo opportunities on the other ebook platforms are around series and box sets for fiction. And so I've decided to just put it in KU. It's also free for five days. So if you listen to this when it goes out, um, A Midwinter Sacrifice is free on Amazon until the end of the 21st of November 2021. I'll see how it goes. So you should be able to read it even if you're not a KU member. I've got another short story coming in January and would probably do the same thing. And then once I've got enough for a collection, then I'll pull them wide because once I have a book length uh, project, then that makes more sense. I will also be narrating those audiobooks as a human. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> I've been narrating those stories. But as I am in a closet, I just don't have my audio set up uh, good enough for doing narration right now. So that's interesting. And I've also tried to do a blurb with Michael Brent's principles in mind. So I am going to read you the short blurb for the short story. At the edge of a blood-stained ancient spring, a pagan goddess awakens from a long sleep thirsty for sacrifice. When down on his luck busker Evan arrives at the Christmas market, he expects to play tunes of festive cheer for the merry crowd and to reap the reward for his music. 
But when an icy winter storm blows in and disaster strikes, Evan must make a choice that can only end in a midwinter sacrifice. <laughs> Red with dark tone. <laughs> so yes, that's my attempt at a, a much more dramatic blurb. So yeah, you can get that on um, on Amazon. Also, since I'm in New Zealand, I've put Risen Gods on Special, the dark fantasy adventure I co-wrote with Jay Thorne, inspired by the Christchurch earthquake and tsunami that hit the city here in New Zealand in 2011 and also combines Maori mythology. The old gods will rise, humanity will fall. And uh, yeah, Ben and Lucy have just days to find each other again after the tsunami and save those they love and the country from the wrath of the risen gods. Uh, I won't read you the whole thing, <laughs> but it is wide. Uh, it is free on most platforms or 99 cents or 99p, uh, depending if it's been price matched. But also you can get it directly from me as a free ebook. So if you fancy some reading, check it out while I'm in New Zealand. It will be on special. So again, payhip.com forward slash the creative pen. You can get it as a free ebook or on any of the other platforms. Right. So thanks for your emails and tweets and comments this week. Hannah Bainbridge says, superb interview with Lisa Cron about using emotion and backstory to draw readers in. Took lots of notes and it will inform how I edit my first draft in the new year. Well worth listening to. Thanks to both. Great, Hannah. Glad you found it useful. And Mayuresh Belsari said, found it wonderful. Thank you for such an interesting podcast. Also love the way you infuse sentences with laughter. There you go. Thank you. And finally, Kay Moore sent a lovely picture. She said, enjoying a beautiful morning walk with the pup along the Kings Beach headland in Australia, listening to the creative pen. So thank you for the lovely picture. And I always enjoy seeing pictures of where you're listening to the show from. So you can tweet me at the creative pen. You can email me joanna at the creative pen dot com or leave a comment on the blog or the YouTube channel. I love to hear from you. It makes this more of a conversation. And of course, thank you for everyone who did the podcast survey. I will be doing a roundup from that in my end of year and my new year 22, 2022 uh, session. Right. So today's show is sponsored by Kobo Writing Life, Kobo's free, fast and easy self-publishing platform. Kobo Writing Life was built by authors for authors and the team of dedicated book lovers are always working hard to help authors reach new readers around the world. With Kobo Writing Life, you can publish both ebooks and audiobooks, distribute to libraries via Overdrive, tap into Kobo's subscription readers through Kobo Plus and reach a whole new global audience. They don't ask for exclusivity, so you are free to publish wherever else you please. So I have personally been publishing with Kobo for almost a decade now. I love their global reach, partnering with different country specific vendors all around the world. So you can reach countries and readers that are impossible to reach otherwise. I've now sold books in 169 countries through Kobo. I also love the promotions tab on Kobo Writing Life, which I use to submit books for marketing every month. And if you don't have access, just ask the friendly team. And of course, if you have any questions, you can ask KWL's helpful team by emailing writinglife at kobo.com or create your free account today at kobo.com forward slash writing life. And uh, they also have a, a good podcast, Kobo Writing Life podcast. So check that out as well. So this type of corporate sponsorship pays for the hosting, transcription and editing. But my time in creating this show is sponsored by my wonderful patrons who actually have been particularly supportive in the last month as I have had uh, a few issues <laughs> as I think about what to do in the future. But my patrons have been helping wonderfully. So thank you to everyone who supports the show on Patreon. Thanks to new patrons, Anthony Craig and Joni Flowers. And thanks to everyone who's been supporting for months and years. You are all amazing. It demonstrates you enjoy the show and want it to continue as we head. Oh my goodness, how many episodes? Well, am I going to commit to a thousand? Probably not quite yet, but I am committing to get to 700. <laughs> right, let's get into the chapters on writing, how to find the time to write and how to make the most of your writing time. This is an excerpt from, uh, this is two chapters, excerpted from Productivity for Authors 
written and narrated by me. Chapter 6. How to find the time to write. Finding time to write is the most important step in writing more, but how do you find the time? In the previous chapters, we started on the process of culling your to-do list, and now we're going to take it a step further. Because after over a decade of writing and more than 30 books published, I found there is only one answer. Schedule your writing time. Seriously, this could be a transformational step if you've not done this before. It's not complicated. Get out your calendar or your smartphone app or however you schedule your time and put in slots for writing. Then show up for that time to write, just as you would show up for a business meeting or a gym class or anything else that is time sensitive. Stop making your writing slot optional or showing up late as if it doesn't matter. As Stephen King says in On Writing, don't wait for the muse. Your job is to make sure the muse knows where you're going to be every day from nine till noon or seven till three. If he does know, I assure you that sooner or later he'll start showing up. You can understand the muse as a metaphor or as more literal if you prefer. Stephen Pressfield, author of The War of Art, invokes the muse before he writes in the classical sense of asking the divine to help inspire his work. Whatever works for you. I know that if I show up to the page, eventually something's going to happen. When I'm working on a first draft, I sit down for my scheduled writing session from 7am until around 9.30, 10am. I take a break, then maybe do another session later on in the day. If I'm sitting at my specific table in my local cafe, my creative brain knows I'm there to write or edit. I don't have any other tasks booked in for that time. If I turn up for my scheduled writing slot, I'm far more likely to write something than if I wait until I have a spare moment. Because let's face it, no one ever has a spare moment. If you don't already use a planning calendar, then it's time to start. You must, must, must schedule your writing time. Presumably, you schedule other things in your life, like going to the day job or your kids' school events, or your dentist appointment, or going to the gym regularly, or whatever. That's how you need to schedule your writing. But what if you try to schedule your writing time and can't find a slot? Track how you spend your time now. This can be challenging and can also be a shock. I did this back when I wanted to write my first non-fiction book in 2006-2007. I looked at my time and realised that I went to the gym in the morning, then I went to work, then I would come home exhausted, make dinner, and sometimes we'd watch three hours of TV before bed. That was every night, or at least most nights, in a week. When I discovered the amount of time I was watching TV consuming rather than producing, I decided to cut back. TV is a lot better these days, but if you're watching three hours a night, you can definitely cut back too. I also know authors who gave up gaming when they became writers, or at least rationed their gaming hours, as it can be such a time suck. What about the gym and exercise time? We all need to stay healthy, and I'll come back to health in chapter 13, but maybe there are some things you can change. For example, in the last couple of years, I've been walking ultra marathons, so in training for that, I would spend 8 to 10 hours walking. In that time, I listened to a lot of audiobooks and sometimes did a bit of dictation. When I realised I needed that time back, I switched to spin class and yoga, which take up less time, and I can still achieve my health goals with a longer walk on Sundays. If you're going to prioritise your writing, you have to change something. I don't recommend you cut out sleep, but there are ways you can optimise it. For example, go to bed earlier, get up earlier and write in the early morning. If you're still struggling to find the time, here's some tough love. How much do you really want this? What is your why 
And what are you willing to give up for your goal? Because something has to give. There are a few other things I did to make time between 2006 and 2011 when I had a day job, before I went full-time as an author entrepreneur. I wrote my first four books in those years, blogged at The Creative Pen, started podcasting and learned about all the things that are needed to build and grow a creative business. I worked a demanding day job, but I still made time to write. I got up at 5am to write before work. I was never going to be able to write after work because I was exhausted by the time I came home. That morning session was always for writing or editing or working on a book, and the extra time I had in the evenings after cutting down TV was for marketing and building my author platform. I opted out of the career ladder. If you have a day job and you're doing everything you can to advance up that career ladder, you will often do a lot more than your official job requires. You'll put in more hours and often work from home, taking up more time but also headspace that you can't use for your writing. So I mentally opted out of my consulting career. I knew I didn't want to follow that path and I didn't want to become a manager. I wanted to do my work then leave on time. I also worked from home as much as possible, often with two laptops open so I could fit in creative business tasks alongside my day job work. I eventually moved to working four days a week at the day job, essentially cutting 20% of my income and 20% of the time that I had to spend at work. Of course, you often have to get as much done in four days as they ask you to do in five, but it helps if you don't have to commute, check email and answer phone calls on that other day. You can just focus on writing. That was how I made the time, but of course, you will have to find what works for you. Where can you carve out time? Right at the edges of the day. Toni Morrison It doesn't need to be big chunks. You don't need a two-hour block to get more writing done. I know of one particular author with five children who keeps her laptop in the kitchen and somehow writes while managing her hectic family life. She has around 50 novels written over the years of child-rearing. For other people, it's writing when the children are asleep in the early morning or late evening. I mentioned TV and gaming, and the other thing that takes time is household tasks. I've outsourced my cleaning for the last decade, which has freed up a lot more of my time. How about combining activities? For example, write while commuting. Mark Dawson, best-selling thriller author, wrote his first five novels while commuting by train for a few hours each day. If you walk or you're in the car, you could try dictating, covered in chapter 8. Once you have time blocks available in your calendar, schedule in the number you need in order to get to your goal. You calculated this in chapter 3 on deadlines. Using that example, if you carve out five hours a week for writing, that's 5,000 words per week, so it will take you 14 weeks to write 70,000 words of a first draft. Get out your schedule and put in your weekly blocks for 14 weeks. That might be one hour per weekday or maybe three blocks in the week and a two-hour session at the weekend. Whatever works for you, but you do need to actually schedule it. Don't skip this step. When you see the time block in your calendar, it is not optional. If you're tempted to skip it, say to yourself, My writing is important. I will be there at that time and I will write. If you do that, you will achieve your goal. Find the time, turn up, do the work and then carry on with your busy life. No one said this was going to be easy. If it was easy, everyone would be writing a book. Everyone says they're writing a book, but in order to actually achieve your goal, you have to turn up and do the work. Some surveys say that 80% of people want to write a book, but very few of those people end up publishing, and even fewer of those end up making a good living with their writing. So the question is, who do you want to be?
On the field of the self stand a knight and a dragon. You are the knight. Resistance is the dragon. The battle must be fought every day. Stephen Pressfield, The War of Art I've had this quote on my wall for years. I wrote it out in ink a long time ago and it's faded now, but I know it off by heart, because the battle must indeed be fought every day. Even if you schedule those 14 weeks of time blocks into your calendar, what happens at 6am on a cold morning as you lie in bed and think, I really don't want to do this. What's the point? I'll just have another hour in bed. There will always be things that will get in your way, and your mind may be your greatest challenge. You must fight that resistance if you want to succeed as a writer. Get up and do your work. Questions Are you scheduling your writing time at the moment? If not, why not? Where is your resistance? Do you have an accurate view of how you spend your time? If not, track a week of activities, including TV and gaming. What are you going to give up in order to find time for your writing? Have you done the calculation on how much time you need for that first draft, or revision time, or whatever you need? Have you scheduled your next block of writing time? Chapter 7. Make the most of your writing time. Now you've carved out the time and scheduled the writing sessions that will help you to achieve your goal, what can you do to make the most effective use of your writing time? 1. Choose the right location. There are no rules, but I suggest that your writing place should be different to the places you do other things. Humans are habitual creatures. We like doing the same things in the same place and it sets off a certain frame of mind. I have a home office where I do my podcasting, interviews, email, accounting and other business tasks. I cannot write or edit my books at the same desk. I write my first drafts and edit at a local cafe. I go early when it opens so they have tables spare and I buy a black coffee every hour in exchange for the writing space. Most people come for takeaways at that time of day, and I'm gone before the rush after 10am. If you like to work in a cafe, make sure to respect the business and be a good customer, so they're happy to have you there. When I'm working on my laptop, I use a neck stand riser and external keyboard for ergonomic positioning. If I'm editing, I print out the whole manuscript and edit by hand. I sometimes edit at home on the dining room table, but never in my office. It helps to keep my spaces separate, because when I'm in my home office, there is always more to do on the business. But when I'm at the cafe, I'm only there for one reason, to create something new in the world. You could go to the library or hire a desk or a room in a co-working space, common in most cities now. If I'm working to a first draft deadline, I will often hire a local room for dictation, in addition to my morning cafe sessions. It costs me around 15 US dollars per hour. If I cancel too late, then I'll have to pay for it anyway, so it forces me to turn up. This accountability helps, especially if I don't feel like writing, and it enables me to finish the first draft more quickly. Of course, the writing process is not just about getting words on a page. This creative time slot is for whatever phase of the creative project that you're in. It might be planning or plotting, research, outlining, first draft writing or editing. But don't mix it up with publishing or marketing activities, which use other parts of your brain. Keep one special location for your creative tasks. 2. Get into the right mindset, quickly. The last thing I do before I sit down to work is say my prayer to the muse. I say it out loud, in absolute earnest. Only then do I get down to business. Stephen Pressfield, The War of Art
Many writers use a ritual to get into the creative mindset, but it is specific to them and not some magic way that can be used by others. So don't get obsessed with finding a perfect ritual, but do establish a routine and a habit around your writing practice, so you can switch into your writing mindset quickly and get on with your work. I go to the cafe and sit at a specific table, order my black coffee, put on my noise-cancelling headphones with rain and thunderstorms on repeat, then write. I use Bose Quiet Comfort noise-cancelling headphones and I love them. I also wear them on aeroplanes and anywhere noise gets to me. As an introvert, I'm highly sensitive to sound. They're pricey, but they're seriously one of the best investments I've ever made in my writing, creativity and productivity. I've also been listening to the same Rain and Thunderstorms album for over a decade. What a bargain! You can also use the Rainy Mood app or find free ambient sounds online to shut out other noise. As soon as the rain starts, my brain knows I'm in a creative space. Nothing else matters. I almost don't hear it anymore, but you will find a storm in almost all of my novels – so it must have some influence. If you like more exciting music or you're interested in what other writers listen to, check out the Undercover Soundtrack blog by Ros Morris, which features authors and the soundtracks for their books. I'm definitely the most boring person ever in terms of my listening habits while I write, but it works for me. You need to find what works for you. 3. Turn off distractions. Turn off your phone and any notifications. Put it on aeroplane mode or silent. If you're worried about an emergency with your kids or your job, put your phone on vibrate, but do whatever you can to stop yourself looking at it during the writing session. No multitasking. In this specific block of writing time, you are not allowed to do anything else than work on your book. If you're writing a first draft, then write the first draft. If you're editing, then edit. If you know that you will end up going down an internet rabbit hole of research, then turn off the internet. Just put a note in the document and come back to it later. Stop making excuses. Do the work. 4. Use timed writing. Timed writing changed my life back in the days when I still dreamed of being a writer. One year, I went to a creative writing class at the Sydney Writers' Festival. I'm a very good student, so I had my notebook at the ready to write down pearls of wisdom. I was prepared to listen and learn. But then the teacher said, The first thing we're going to do is write for ten minutes about a day when you discovered something that would change your life. He looked at his watch. Ten minutes. Off you go. Everyone around me started writing fast as I sat there for a moment, stunned. You mean I actually have to write something? As I picked up my pen, I realised that I had not faced a timed writing exercise since school exams, and it was definitely my first time with a creative writing prompt. But I started writing anyway and after ten minutes, I had a couple of paragraphs about a particular memory. It shocked me and changed my life, because I really didn't think I could create from my brain like that. It pushed me past my self-doubt, and I started using timed writing sessions for everything. In 2009, I did NaNoWriMo, National Novel Writing Month, and I used timed writing to get my first 20,000 words down. I eventually turned those words into the beginning of Stone of Fire. You can try writing sprints if you're in a writing group, online or off. You could also try nanowrimo.org in November, when lots of people write at the same time. You'll often find writing groups in your town during this period. There are also habit tracking apps that you can use with writing timers, or check out the Pomodoro technique developed by Francesco Cirillo. You can find information about that online. You may find other techniques useful, but timed writing was the thing that got me over myself. Don't just sit down and see what you can come up with in an hour. 
Do several timed blocks with a little break in between and you will achieve more in the same time. 5. Stop procrastinating. If you're still struggling with checking email and social media or gaming apps, whatever else you're procrastinating with, you need to be self-aware enough to say, I've got to stop this. Put your phone on aeroplane mode and turn off notifications. How many times do I have to say this? Seriously, I've been to so many writing events where authors will have notifications coming through constantly. Ping, ping, ping. Don't do that. If you're still struggling, schedule a procrastination break. Say to yourself, I know my brain needs to procrastinate, so I'm going to write for 20 minutes and then I'm going to stop and have a social media or email break or whatever you need. Set a timer for five minutes so you don't lose track of time, then get back to writing. The professional shows up every day. The professional is committed over the long haul. The amateur tweets. The pro works. Stephen Pressfield, Turning Pro I reread Turning Pro every new year because it continues to challenge me in my creative life. Because I do tweet at the creative pen. I like tweeting and it serves my business. I like Instagram too. Social media has its place, but not when it takes your writing time. 6. Measure your progress. It can be really hard to see your progress, especially in the first draft of your first book. In your mind, you can see a finished book. It's amazing. But then you sit down and write 500 words and realise you have a long way to go. And you do. But everything worth doing takes time. There are a number of ways you can measure your progress. I use Project Targets on Scrivener, which has a progress bar that turns from red to green for each writing session and also for the book as a whole. Many writers use spreadsheets or apps to track word count. I used a physical wall calendar when I started out, as it keeps creation top of mind. I used coloured pens and stickers to reward my creative self. Who doesn't love a sticker for good work? I get a sticker for 2,000 plus words in a session and if I was under, I'd just write the word count in a coloured pen. One month, I logged 42,905 words that way and it was motivating to see the word count add up over the days. This idea of don't break the chain or don't break the streak is common in habit formation and it's a great idea if you're in first draft mode. Word count matters less when you're in editing or other stages of the creative process, but you might still log hours spent on the project or pages edited. In James Clear's book Atomic Habits, he suggests filling a jar with paper clips and putting an empty jar beside it. Each paper clip could represent a writing session or a thousand words or whatever is appropriate. After each session, move a paper clip from one jar to the other and over time the originally empty jar will fill up and you can see your progress. You might feel like you haven't achieved much in one writing session, but if you focus on the process rather than the finished product, you will see progress over time. Habit tracking keeps your eye on the ball. You're focused on the process rather than the results. It's remarkable what you can build if you just don't stop. James Clear, Atomic Habits. 7. Know what you're going to write before you write it. This is definitely a way to make the most of your writing time, but how you do this will depend on the kind of writer you are. I'm a discovery writer, so I don't outline. However, on my walk to the cafe or the days between or out on a walk, I'll be thinking about my characters or the topic I want to write about for non-fiction and I might jot down some notes or think about possibilities so that when I sit down to write, I know what I'm there to do or at least have a starting point. Other writers swear by an outline. Perhaps a few lines or paragraph per chapter which you can expand during your writing time. 
Some authors, like thriller author Jeffrey Deaver, write extensive outlines. Of course, you don't have to do it all in advance. You could spend five to ten minutes at the beginning of your writing session thinking about what you will write, jot down a few bullet points, and then expand them in your writing session. 8. Spend more hours in the chair. Authors who are massively productive spend more of their time writing. Fantasy author Lindsay Barroca will sometimes write for eight hours a day. She can write a book in a month because she puts in the hours. I have never written for eight hours in a single day, so it takes me longer to put the hours in so I don't produce as many books. If you spend more hours in the writing chair, you are going to spend more time writing. You will write more words per day as a result. If you don't have more hours in the day, then carve out more writing sessions in the week. If you're managing one hour three times a week, but you want to be more productive with your writing, then do one hour six times a week. You will double the number of words written and get to your goal faster. 9. No excuses. What if you don't feel like writing? What if you're too tired or you've got a headache? Would you go to your day job in your current condition? Are you taking your writing just as seriously? Obviously, if you're really sick, then no worries, take a break. But many people go to their day job when they don't feel like it, or they're tired or they have a headache they still manage to get their work done, even if they're not in the mood. There are days when I sit down to write and I find it so hard. I really don't want to be there. Then another day it feels amazing. I'm in flow and everything is brilliant. But the truth is, you will not be able to tell the difference between those two pieces of writing when you read the book later. It makes no difference to the finished product. No excuses. Do your work. Don't wait for the muse. He's a hard-headed guy who's not susceptible to a lot of creative fluttering. This isn't the Ouija board or the spirit world we're talking about here, but just another job like laying pipe or driving long-haul trucks. Stephen King, On Writing. Questions. What does your creative setup and ritual look like? How will you stop distractions and interruptions? Have you tried timed writing? If not, why not? How will you measure your progress? How could you write faster? Are there any other ways that will help you make the most of your time writing? So I hope you found the chapters of the Productivity for Authors audiobook useful and that you're able to spend some time, I guess, scheduling for 2022 and make the most of that writing time to create the books that you really want to spend your time on in the next year. I also enjoyed reminding myself of the importance of this, since you might have noticed that I get distracted by all the things. And if you do have time for reading and learning or reading for entertainment, remember you can get 30% off my ebooks and audiobooks, direct fiction and nonfiction at payhip.com forward slash the creative pen using the discount coupon 2021 valid till the end of the year. And you can also get 30% off my courses using the same code 2021 at the creativepen.com forward slash learn links in the show notes. Right, next week I'll be doing my end of year roundup, but before then it's Christmas. <laughs> so happy Christmas if you celebrate it. And if not, then happy holidays anyway, or just happy week. Uh, our own family is a mix of pagan, Christian, Jewish, and Muslim. <laughs> So that's why I always say happy holidays <laughs> to cater for everyone. So happy writing, and I'll see you next time. Thanks for listening today. I hope you found it helpful. You might also like the backlist episodes and show notes available at thecreativepen.com forward slash podcast. You can also get your free author blueprint at thecreativepen.com forward slash blueprint. If you'd like to connect, you can tweet me at The Creative Pen or find me on Facebook at The Creative Pen. See you next time.